today we're going to have a discussion about the bacterial cell wall. This lecture is part of the whole lecture series on bacteria, and we're going to review the principles of the cell wall, why the cell wall is so important, both in relationship to survival of the bacteria, but also in terms of the capacity of the immune system to recognize the bacteria according to the cell wall characteristics, and then also development of antibiotics in relationship to, for instance, being even able to penetrate uh, the cell wall. So the overview of today's discussion, we're going to discuss uh, how the cell wall contributes to bacterial classification what the structure of the cell wall is composed of, and a brief discussion about distinguishing gram-positive from gram-negative bacteria. Now, we will review gram-positive and gram-negative characteristics also when we begin to discuss uh, various examples of bacteria. So in terms of classification, that one criteria by which bacteria is classified on is the basis of the cell wall. So we're going to uh, evaluate classification in relationship to the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative. But also, uh, there are some bacteria who don't have a cell wall at all. And then there are other bacteria that have chemically unique cell walls, and those bacteria will also be discussed in a separate lecture. Uh, so before we get into the cell wall, I, I brought up the uh, information about the prototype cell. And this prototype cell are, is representative of the characteristics that are found in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now remember, bacteria are a member of the prokaryotic cells. So both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have a plasma membrane. They both have cytoplasm. The eukaryotes have a nucleus. The prokaryotes have nuclear material, but they do not have a nucleus. However, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes do have uh, DNA associated proteins and also RNA. So some of the principles of the cell wall have to do with the fact that the cell wall is basically one of the principal mechanisms that the bacteria protect themselves from the hostile or external environments. And those environments can, can include within the human host and then outside of the human host. These cell walls enable the bacteria to survive in fluid environments that differ from intracellular uh, environments. So, for instance, with the bacteria, they're often in environments where the outside of the cell or outside of the bacteria is very dilute, and then inside of the cell is very concentrated with various cytoplasmic material. And for those of you who remember your chemistry lectures, your biochemistry lectures, and your cell biology lectures know that in this kind of situation, what we have is water rushing in as, uh, in terms of the osmotic process. I hope you haven't forgotten about that. So the osmotic pressure of water to enter the bacterial cell is very strong. So we have this wonderfully thick wall that keeps uh, the water out, for instance, but also keeps the uh, shape of the cell fairly rigid and, and, is, and is able to withstand the extreme pressure that is found when the bacteria is in these dilute environments. The other uh, aspect of cell wall, of the cell wall, is it provides a mechanism and a source of attack by the antibiotics, and the cell wall provides a source of identification by other bacteria, other organisms, and of course the immune system. So the peptidoglycan is what the cell wall is composed of, and the peptidoglycan is basically a meshwork of carbohydrates and proteins arranged in a lattice 
uh, type design. And these carbohydrates are cross-linked by amino acids. And in the, this material that they're arranged in is called murine and uh, or murine, so to speak. And so the cell wall protects the plasma membrane from damage. Now in both gram positive and gram negative cells, the true plasma membrane of the cell is enclosed by the peptidoglycan. And as I said before, the peptidoglycan actually provides structural integrity to the cell. And if the peptidoglycan is the most external layer, that is why you get gram staining of that particular uh, peptidoglycan layer. So here is a picture of, it's actually an electron micrograph picture of the gram positive and gram negative. It's like basically a cross section of the two different kinds of bacteria. So here in gram positive, you see that the peptidoglycan layer is fairly thick. It's the most external layer. And then underneath the peptidoglycan is the cell uh, plasma membrane. So it's basically a two layered system. Here, gram negative bacteria, we actually have an outer layer that is a membrane itself. Uh, underneath the membrane, we have the peptidoglycan, which is actually sandwiched between the outer membrane, and this orange is the plasma membrane. So those two, uh, basically those two membranes actually enclose the peptidoglycan, and if you can see, the peptidoglycan in the gram uh, negative cell is actually thinner than in the gram positive. And when I talk uh, to students about these two examples, I often, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ask them to remember if they've ever gone into a uh, automobile store or a tire store and have looked at these various kinds of tires. And you'll see that the really expensive radial tires are the ones with multiple layers and often the thickness of those tires is thinner actually than the cheaper tires that have fewer layers and that are much thicker. And these thinner multi-layer tires are more expensive, they're higher performing, they can withstand these different climate conditions and they last a lot longer. Now, here with these gram uh, negative bacteria, we see that with these multiple layers, they actually have more of an armamentum in terms of being able to withstand all these different kinds of attacks from antibiotics, from Im the immune system, from various kinds of environmental conditions. But you know, the gram positive cells do a good job in terms of having this thick external layer that is there to protect the gram positive bacteria. So here in detail is what the gram positive bacterial cell wall actually looks like. So you can see that the peptidoglycan layer here is actually external to the lipid bilayer uh, plasma membrane here. And uh, it provide, you know, it's thicker as we saw than the gram negative uh, bacteria. And when the uh, gram positive bacteria are stained with a purple dye, the external layer, because it's external, actually registers the dye. Now, the antigenic specificity in these gram positive bacteria is uh, facilitated by these tachoic uh, acids that actually are embedded in the uh, peptidoglycan layer. And also the gram positive, for instance, uh, strep or streptococci have these polysaccharides, which are carbohydrates that are embedded both in the cell wall and actually in the, in the cell uh, membrane underneath. And it enables, uh, I guess, human biologists, microbiologists can actually use these qualities to further characterize gram-positive bacteria. So we'll get into that later when we delve into the details of each of the gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria.
So the gram-negative bacterial cell wall is actually, as you remember, is basically a sandwich kind of situation where we've got the outer membrane and the inner membrane, and then the peptidoglycan is sandwiched between the two membranes. And this allows for more complexity, for more variation in terms of developing ways to defend itself. So these having, so you'd think, well, you know, gosh, how can having an external membrane help with defending against all these different ways and, and enemies and, and uh, antibiotics and immune mechanisms? Well, in the outer membrane, you can have things like you can have your own enzymes, for instance. You can have your own denutralizing or detoxifying chemicals or agents that can actually invalidate uh, some of these antibiotics. So this outer membrane actually produce, provides a barrier to certain, to certain antibiotics like bacteria. It provides a barrier to lysozymes, which remember are the enzymes that uh, the human organism utilizes as a first line defense. It can provide a barrier to detergents and heavy metals, bile, for instance. And, you know, it can have its own chemical uh, armory, so to speak, to denutralize some of these things. The other thing is the outer membrane also contains lipid A, which actually is an endotoxin. So that endotoxin is released when the bacteria die. And that can actually prove to be a very uh, deleterious event because, for instance, when you have, and we'll talk about that when we get more into the concepts of infection, but you can have a sepsis, which is a very extreme form of infection that where, you know, a, a large part of the blood supply and of the human organism is, has very high levels of bacteria. And for instance, if you eradicate that bacteria and that bacteria happens to have this endotoxin, that endotoxin gets released. And so sometimes this antibiotic treatment can actually serve to worsen the condition. So we'll get into that when we discuss uh, sepsis and some of the other concepts that occur with infection. So the gram stain, as I talked about before, that is a way in which you can distinguish gram-positive from gram-negative bacteria. And in the late 1800s, uh, a Danish scientist named Hans Christian, not Anderson, no, this is Hans Christian Graham, uh, invented a stain that was eventually named after him uh, to visualize bacteria. Now, he, at that time, did not know these differences between gram-positive and gram-negative. But the way it works is that in gram-positive bacteria, we have the peptidoglycan on the outside of the bacteria, and that uh, peptidoglycan layer is what basically the stain uh, uh, visualizes, or the stain colors. And gram-negative bacteria, because they don't have that layer on the outside, they basically register as being colorless when using this gram stain. And so then uh, there's a counter stain applied, and that counter stain is pink. So here we see the pink is the gram negative, and the purple, of course, is gram positive. The gram positive bacteria, on the other hand, are uh, killed by penicillin, among other things, and another kind of antibiotic called cephalosporin. And in terms of being killed by penicillin, what penicillin does is it inactivates the repair mechanism of the cell wall. So it doesn't really, I guess, eat through the cell wall. It just basically deactivates the repair mechanism and eventually the bacteria die. It's, it's quite effective uh, for gram-positive bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, are more resistant to these antibiotics. But this is one of the main reasons why it's so important to wait a little while when you do have, for instance, a respiratory infection to see, first of all, if it's bacterial, and second of all, if what kind of bacteria it is. Because penicillin, for instance, won't work uh, against a gram-negative bacteria.
So the first question we have is, describe the mechanisms that gram-positive bacteria use to defend itself against the immune system. Well, number one, as you can imagine, is the cell wall. That's its biggest weapon, okay? And so that cell wall does a great job in some circumstances. In other circumstances, it just doesn't work. So in the, in the case of gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, we have other uh, weapons, so to speak, but it, it's almost like being in a fort, you know, with a huge thick wall, but basically that's the only protection you have against the enemy. And in some, in a lot of cases it works, and in a lot of other cases it certainly uh, isn't adequate. So of course the second counterpart question is, describe the mechanisms that gram-negative bacteria use to defend itself against the immune system. So the first, these kinds of questions are very common, by the way, in these microbiology classes. So you really need to get your mind clear about gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. These are bacteria that basically are rather different from one another they also can survive in different circumstances. They are adaptive in some places and not adaptive in others. So just knowing this little bit about these two types of bacteria will help you in terms of choice of an antibiotic, for instance. Uh, you don't want to take the wrong antibiotic. Also, you don't want to take an antibiotic, for instance, when you have a viral infection. The other thing is that the outer membrane of that gram-negative bacteria is quite effective. It actually has its own uh, collection of enzymes and toxins and inactivating agents so that the antibiotics in some cases are not effective against gram-negative bacteria. The other thing is gram-negative bacteria, because they're more complex to begin with, they have more of a capacity to rearrange themselves, to become, for instance, to even induce uh, antibiotic resistance. They're more capable of, in fact, inducing antibiotic resistance. So the, the and then also, aside from the outer membrane, they also have the cell wall. And that cell wall essentially is a second line of defense. And then they also have a plasma membrane. So they have more layers and they have more of a capacity to withstand these immune and antibiotic attacks and these challenging uh, external different kinds of environments that they live in. So it's really important to get a clear sense of the two bacteria, get a sense of where they live, what they're like, what kinds of agents can be used against them, how the immune system recognizes them, what kind of mechanisms can be used in order to eradicate them. So that concludes our lecture for the day. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.